Here's the second part, then a B2. Um, we'll start with diffusion. Very common idea in, um, in biology. It is that particles or molecules, whatever you want to say, as long as they're free to move, so particles in a gas can move around, particles in a liquid can move around, they will go from a high to a low concentration. And you can think of it like a slope or a gradient, if you will. You know, if this was a slope and I put a ball at the top, it would roll down. You don't have to do anything, it would roll down the gradient from high to low. It's actually a gravity gradient, if you like. But um, particles move from a high to a low concentration. With diffusion, even when, um, this is where the model falls apart, I suppose. You know, if we had a room, the classic example is things like air freshener or perfume in a room. It spreads out to fill the room. It will spread out until you've achieved an even concentration, but it doesn't stop at that point. It keeps diffusing, it keeps moving around. It's just that it never, um, never concentrates in one area again. So effectively, once your perfume is spread out around a room, it stays at that same concentration, but the particles are still actually moving. Places you tend to find diffusion, the lungs are a classic example. Um, oxygen will tend to diffuse in from the air into your blood. Carbon dioxide will tend to diffuse out because it's a higher concentration in your blood than it is um, in the air. The other example is leaves. That's a bit more difficult. Remember the stomata underneath the leaves. Um, generally, in this case, during the daytime, when it's nice and light, carbon dioxide diffuses in and oxygen diffuses out. And then during the night time, when there's no light and no photosynthesis happening, you tend to get this situation, the same as in the lungs. So leaves are a bit more complicated because depending on the time of day, you get these gases moving in and out in different ways. But that, those are the two classic examples, lungs and leaves, where you get diffusion. Um, we'll do osmosis next, which is a, a particular case of diffusion. It tends to be quite a difficult question, this. The simple way to think of it, <laughs> as simple as you can get it, is that water, and you always think about water when you do osmosis, moves towards wherever it is more concentrated. So if you have um, you know, a nice example, if you've got a test tube and you filled it with water and you put a jelly baby inside, let's see if I can draw a jelly baby, there's a jelly baby. A jelly baby is full of sugar. Okay, so it's more concentrated in the jelly baby than the outside, so water will move into the jelly baby and it'll swell up. If you leave it in there for a little while, um, it would get bigger and bigger and kind of swell up like that. And that's what your cells will do in pure water. They will swell, water will move in and they swell up. Of course, they've got a mechanism to stop them swelling too much. They, they kind of pump stuff out. If you're a plant cell, you've got a cell wall. If you're a fungi or a bacterial cell, you've got a cell wall and that prevents you bursting. But that's what happened. Water moves into where it's most concentrated. Of course, if you instead had, uh, if you put it into really sugary water, um, or really salty water, I guess is the other way to think of it, the opposite would happen. It would kind of shrivel up. So you'd need something really kind of sugary uh, on the outside uh, and the water would leave. So water in osmosis moves to wherever it's the most sugary or salty or the higher concentration. Okay. And finally, active transport. And again, this tends to be a little bit difficult to, to get your head around, I suppose, at first. In the membrane of cells, we know that the cell membrane controls what goes in and out of our cell. Okay. Inside that, uh, sorry, in the membrane itself, we have these little pumps, if you like, that's how you can think of it. And they can pump stuff in or out, depending on what you want them to do. Um, so if in our cell, for example, I don't know what this is, this is some kind of, I don't know, let's say it's sugar. And our cells like sugar, they like, let's say it's glucose, okay? They want that in there, but there's a higher concentration inside outside now normally in diffusion we'd expect these to move out by diffusion but we want to go the opposite way we want these things to go in so what we're trying to do in active transport is to go against a concentration gradient now again this is where the slope idea helps us this time it's like we're at the bottom of the slope now the ball won't just roll up on its own we've got to give it a push 
and it's the same situation here. We can't get it to go against that gradient naturally. We have to give it a bit of a push, or if you like, well, technically, we have to use some energy to pump this stuff through. So active transport, the active bit, refers to the fact that energy is required for this to, to work, okay? Classic place where this would happen would be um, in your intestines. So as the food is moving through your intestine, you will get to a point where some of the food will kind of diffuse out into your blood, and that's great, but we want all of it. We don't want it to get to a kind of level where, well, it's kind of going backwards and forwards, and it, it, you know, that would mean we'll be losing a lot of our food. So active transport is taking place in your gut. Okay, and we pump this stuff through into your blood where we can use it. It means that um, the cells in your intestine would have lots of mitochondria in them. Mitochondria, if you remember, aerobic respiration provide lots of energy for the cell and active transport requires energy, so we'd find cells that do a lot of active transport use a lot of mitochondria. In fact, all cells are really doing some form of active transport. It's a very common thing. The other classic one is um, in roots, so root hair cells. They will actively transport in minerals. Now remember that minerals in this case really means elements. That's the way you can think of it. For example, magnesium, uh, nitrates. That's another thing that's pumped in, which is a combination of nitrogen and oxygen. They pump this stuff in. Now remember this links to osmosis here. If you start pumping stuff into your roots, water will follow in because water follows wherever it's most concentrated. So that's how the roots are absorbing so much water at the same time. Now lastly on this, um, just to mention, I suppose what we call an exchange surface or something in your body, or in anything's body, um, that needs to absorb something, whether it's your lungs, whether it's um, in a fish, the gills, whether it's leaves trying to absorb carbon dioxide or whatever it may be. The four things that can help um, with absorption. Uh, a large surface area, the larger your, you know, your intestines, the larger the surface area, the more you can absorb, the larger a leaf, the more it can absorb. Um, they should be thin so that um, whatever you're absorbing doesn't have to go through lots and lots of material. Um, certainly in animals, you'd need a good blood supply so your intestines have a very good blood supply um, after you've eaten food. A lot of blood is diverted down there. And in the case of the things like the lungs, you'd say ventilation, which basically means you don't just breathe in the lung full of air and wait for it to be absorbed. Um, you keep refreshing the air over and over again. You keep breathing, and that maintains a concentration gradient. We're constantly bringing in air that contains a higher concentration of oxygen, we're constantly getting rid of the air that contains a higher concentration of carbon dioxide. So those four things are typical of an exchange surface um, where we want to absorb something.